university's connection with aviation is long and storied, educating pilots, aeronautical engineers, and future astronauts. In 1930, Purdue became the first university to own and operate an airport in the United States. And four years later, in 1934, a chance meeting led the university to employ one of the most famous pilots in the world. This relationship created a lasting impact at Purdue that is still being felt today. Amelia Earhart was the most famous career woman of her time. She was a beacon of hope, not only to women, but to everyone because of the times. Amelia Earhart was a comet that shot across the sky in the 1930s and then just disappeared. Amelia Earhart was known around the world for the first woman to fly across the Atlantic. Now she flew as a passenger, she didn't pilot that aircraft, but later in 1932 she became the first woman to actually fly solo across the Atlantic. Her fame just shot to the sky. She was just world famous because this woman had done this thing that they didn't think any woman could do and uh, apparently very few men could do. She was an accomplished flyer racer and she spoke quite a bit around the country about women and how they could have careers and they could be just as accomplished as a man could be. So before the war, Purdue was built to hold a maximum of 7,000 people. 6,000 students and 800 women. So it was like this little nucleus of women. Edward Elliott was the president of the university from 1921 until 1946. Elliott was talking a lot at that time about the problem of education for women students. Most were in home economics because that was what was offered to women. When they got a college degree, they left Purdue and got married. In the 1930s, in the first part of the century, it wasn't common for women to work outside of the home. President Edward Elliott met Amelia in New York at a Women and the Changing World conference. Amelia was a speaker. This modern world of science and invention is of particular interest to women. And he heard her talk about women and women's careers and the potential that women had. He was intrigued. He got to talk to Amelia more, and they were on the same wavelength. They wanted to help women find themselves, to find careers that they could do with their college education. I think that President Elliott saw in Amelia Earhart that she could be a role model for the women who were studying at Purdue. Elliott said, we would love to have you at Purdue, and she said she would like that. What should I do? And what he proposed was that she would become an advisor to our program in aeronautics, and she would become a career counselor for women students on the Purdue campus. She accepted the position in the fall of 1935. Amelia Earhart came to our campus. She would stay here for about two weeks at a time. She lived in Doomy Hall. And it was Dorothy Stratton's idea that she stay there. Dorothy was the Dean of Women. She thought the easiest way, the best way, for Amelia to really get to know the women students was to live in the residence hall. Living with the students gave them an opportunity to interact with her and to, to eat dinner with her. A woman resident said Amelia came to her door and popped her head around the corner and said, can I borrow your pencil and, and I'll bring it back in a sec. And as she went back to her room, came back, and the room was full of young women who were sitting there waiting for her to come back. And she got the hint and she started talking to them. And she would look at one and say, you, you're a sophomore, aren't you? And I know you're dating a senior in engineering. He's gonna graduate in June and what's gonna happen then? He's gonna ask you to marry him. He's gonna want you to leave campus with him. Don't do it, stay here. Get your education. Find out about yourself. This was a whole new experience for this woman. They weren't getting this kind of talk any place. So she would meet with the women students, talk to them about their aspirations. One of the documents that we have in the archives is a questionnaire that she gave to the women students. With different questions about what women thought they would be doing after college and what kinds of work and why they would want to work. And she was surprised by some of the answers because they really wanted to work because it was what they wanted to do, they said. Me Earhart claimed that she was the first counselor on careers for women students at any university in the country, and I believe she was. The other thing about Amia is that she wore slacks. Purdue was very formal at that time, and the, the women students all had to wear dresses. It's very hard to get in an airplane in those days in, in a skirt, because you had to climb into it. So when she came into the dining hall still dressed in what she wore to fly, they thought, well, why can't we do that? And they were told, well, when you fly across the Atlantic, you can do the same thing.
When Amelia Earhart was on campus, she was a celebrity, so students were, you know, over the moon about her. The women students were. Some of the male students thought it was tough enough to find dates, and so they didn't want her saying, oh, you know, don't worry about getting married or, you know, finding someone right away, go out and get a job. Elliot really loved Earhart. He was just captivated by her. He said, you know, what else do you want to do? And she said, well, I'd like to do what she called one more adventure. I'd like to fly around the globe at the equator. And he said, maybe I can help you do that. And the Purdue Research Foundation helped raise the money and gave them a grant to purchase the Lockheed Electra. Dorothy Stratton, Dina Women, brought all the women to see it at Purdue's airport. There are some really neat pictures of all the women beaming with pride. She's our Amelia. The plane was a Lockheed Electra, and it was called the Flying Laboratory. Her fly was to be partly research, not just spectacle. She was going to do scientific experiments on long-duration flights. Amelia Earhart and her crew at Oakland, California, ready for her great aerial adventure around the world flight by way of the equator, a journey no pilot has yet attempted. The world flight started first in March of 1937 from Oakland, and from there they were flying to Honolulu, and then from there they would fly to Holland Island. She had an accident trying to take off from the airport in Honolulu, damaged the plane. So that first leg was scrapped. President Elliott sent a telegram to her of encouragement after that happened. You are commissioned and charged to give A.E. a special Purdue greeting when she lands today. Her courageous exploits have given a thrill to every member of the Boilermakers Guild. They are all with her to the successful end of the flight. So in May of 1937, the second attempt was initiated. The weather conditions had changed, so she decided to fly east. Through the month of, of June, she flew around the world, things went pretty well. So at each stop, she would take photographs of the people at the airports, the local inhabitants, some of the landscapes. Amelia kept a journal along the way. Her and her husband had plans to publish a book about the flight. And so what's really interesting is that every stop along the way, she would send her pages back to him. So we have the, the journal pages from each leg of the flight describing what the experiences were like on that flight. Rain clouds hung around Carapito this morning as we left. We flew low over jungle, most way to coast, then played hide and seek with showers until decided I'd better forego watching scenery and climb up on top, 8,000 feet topped all but high as clouds. By the time they got to Ley, they had completed about 22,000 miles, so they were almost finished with the trip. The island they were gonna land on before Hawaii, this little Howland Island, was a teardrop in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Very, very small thing. We're talking, you know, a mile wide, two miles long. A speck in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So at that time in the 1930s, with the technology of navigation, it was extremely difficult to find. Her navigator, Fred Noonan, was using some of the same techniques that Columbus did when he crossed the ocean. He was navigating by stars. He was dropping things out of the plane to check wind direction and wind speed. They left for Holland Island on July 1st. It was a beautiful, clear day. The Coast Guard was waiting at that island. They couldn't see her in the sky. The Coast Guard cutters had some communications from them via the radio. And they could hear her, but she could not hear them. One of the last things that they heard was that they were tacking north and south, trying to find the island. But they never landed. Something happened. And you know the exact reasons for all this, we don't know. Her legacy is one of the most famous people to disappear, and we don't know what happened to her. But really, she was such a strong proponent of women's rights and women's ability to have careers, to, to have a job and a family. One of the things that I research is the way that specific women become iconic feminists for their time. The Amelia Earhart Faculty in Residence Program is brand new in a way, but in another way it started uh, in the 1930s with Amelia Earhart. So the idea of embedding a faculty person in the residence hall is to bring more of the students' personal lives into view 
for the faculty. That's something that I think that I have really benefited from. We have been living there since early August. I have a seven-year-old and a partner who is a historian. We are making our family life in the residence hall with five or six hundred Windsor residents. Taking on the position was very intriguing on both a scholarly level as well as, you know, from sort of the heart of an educator. And what I'm really interested in is how Amelia Earhart is imagined as this role model. The George Palmer Putnam Collection of Amelia Earhart Papers is housed at the Purdue Archives and Special Collections. We have over 5,500 items. To mark the 80th anniversary of Amelia's disappearance, we held an exhibit. The exhibit was kind of interesting because we showcased the items that Amelia and Fred sent back during the trip. So it kind of presented the last flight through their eyes. To think about that the items were actually on that last flight is one of the sort of wondrous things about an archive or special collections because you really can connect with history with a tangible object and you can imagine that object has a life and where it was. Sometimes in order to teach people, you have to inspire them first. And when Amelia Earhart would go in and talk to a class about flight, she'd done it and she was successful in inspiring him. She stood as an example of someone who believed in herself and who knew that one's abilities really mattered most. It didn't matter if you were a man or a woman. I think Amelia's impact is still felt, but maybe we need to listen to it again. The, some of the same verbiage that Amelia said back then, oh women, you can be scientists and you can be engineers and you can be anything you want. I think the legacy is that we need to keep listening to what she said because we're not there yet. May I hope this movement will spread throughout all branches of applied science and industry and that women may come to share with men the joy of doing. Those can appreciate rewards most who have helped create. Instead of giving Amelia Earhart's priceless memorabilia to a renowned museum, Amelia's husband, George Palmer Putnam, donated the collection to Purdue because of what he said was Amelia's love of the university. In 2002, another donation from the Putnam family made Purdue's collection the most comprehensive repository of materials related to Amelia Earhart. That'll wrap up this edition of Boiler Bites. Remember that you can catch up on all our past stories at BoilerBites.com. See you next time.